welcome back to GovCon Hacks Live. I'm Ashley Jewell with Jewell Dev LLC, and I'm joined by Natasha Velez with MVS Strategic Solutions. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> I'm just I'm Sarah Chinati, and I'm a proposal manager, and I'm here to help you with the actual getting your template ready to start writing. So I think a lot of times people start writing, and then they're like, "Oh, am I answering what they asked me?" Mm -hmm. um, are you okay with me starting? Yeah. So just for a little context for our audience, while you're doing that, we did part one. So we're going to kind of pick up where we left off, give you guys a little bit more context. So the last time we talked about setting up your template, and I think we got as far as getting all the red stuff in and all the red stuff are your instructions. Mm -hmm. So now we want to add in the rest, which you see here, we have some blue and we have some green and I do blue evaluation and I do green PWS or SOW. Um, obviously you do whatever you want. Um, so the instructions, so I'm using the same RFP as I had before. So your instructions are generally, not always, but generally in section L of your RFP. And this is what I use and I recommend everyone use to format their entire proposal. And then you can go through and stick in your evaluation criteria and your PWS criteria. So I added in, they did not have a lot of evaluation criteria, unfortunately. Um, so I added that in in blue and I added in the PWS items in green. So I don't really know how to get into this because I can appreciate if so I just stick up here 10 pages just as you know a reminder to myself that I only have 10 pages. I can appreciate if you're saying to me, now wait a second, you're saying that I need to speak to all of my capabilities and I have to speak to all of these PWS items um, and you want me to do all of that in 10 pages. Maybe 10 pages is plenty of space. Maybe that's you know only the tip of the iceberg. I don't know. That's part of your strategy discussion. And that's part of how do we get the, how do we get our solution across? And so just some examples of things that I've seen is I've seen a giant picture that shows the entire con ops. And then it might have, um, when I say con ops, I mean like, how am I going to do this entire work? And then it might have PWS if there are numbers, there are no numbers here applicable, so that probably wouldn't be helpful. But if they have, you know, PWS 3.1, respond to help us, then within the picture, you might want to put 3.1 where you're doing that exact thing. Um, I've also seen people do put it in a table and say over here, respond to help desk. And then on this side, they might talk about how they're going to respond to the help desk. There are a multitude of ways of answering this PWS type item. It's just a matter of what tells your story best within the page count and meets all the requirements of both the red and the blue. Okay, so after I get all of this structured and I built a little rough, I wouldn't even call this a resume because if you, they do ask for a resume, but they only ask that you provide education skills, training and certifications. So, you know, that's another discussion. Can I get across everything that I want to say in your sort of traditional resume where you have, you know, professional experience and then you list the company that they work for and the, and the projects that they've done? Or is it better for you to write a paragraph and to stick in PWS items to show this person has done the work and they've managed the work and they've done this for years? These are all strategy questions that you have to find what works best for you. And what works best for you may not work best for you on every single proposal. So I've also set up the um, past performance. And again, our PWS items make an appearance. And again, you may not need to speak to every single one of these in your, um, so you have to provide in this particular proposal, you have to provide three references. Maybe all three of yours cover all three or all PWS items every single time. Maybe you can show across my three projects, I hit every single one of these PWS items. You know, you have, again, you have to figure out what, how you can tell the best story on how you do 
how you plan on doing this work and that you are low risk because you've done this before. That's the whole point of the past performance is that you're low risk. Okay. Now you have it all set up. Okay. We used our section L to set it up. Now what I do after I set up my shell and again, before I start writing, like it takes me a couple of hours, not a couple of hours. I'm gonna say it takes me like a good solid hour or two to get this set up before I really start writing. What I will do is based on this and the story I wanna tell is I will come up with um, bullets of things that I wanna make sure I hit in this section. So I'm in the cover letter section and I have these bullets. I already wrote them out so you guys don't have to dive bored. I'm watching me type all this stuff out. So I have things like, this is where you introduce your team and why you're the right team for the job. And when I say team, I mean, if your company is partnered with another company. If you're not, then you would just say why your company is the right company for this job. You wanna show that you understand where the customer is right now with their work. Then you want to under, you want to show them that you understand where they want to go and how you're going to take them there and how you're a strategic partner with them, that you understand current state, future state, and you're the bridge. Okay. So now we're going to go to technical. Now, what are some things that I want to get across in technical? Yes, I want to speak to all the PWS items. Of course I do. But there are other things that I want to make sure I used to structure my understanding of the PWS. Now, I'm gonna stick a lot of stuff in here. Don't panic. These are just suggestions for you to use for any technical section. So not every technical section is gonna get all of this, but it shows that you have the understanding of the work, the existing conditions. This is sort of like the cover letter is sort of a brief overview. This is really getting into the details of, I understand where this PWS item is right now, I understand where you want to go. I understand, you know, this is my suggestion for the bridge from here to there. How you're going to manage it, how you're going to collaborate with the government or other stakeholders, um, how you're going to continue to improve it as, you know, you're now the owner of this hot mess. So not only do you have to make it better, but you have to constantly make it better. So just something to think about when you take on these projects is that it's not just the winning it's the keeping the win. Um, I, you know, any uncertainties that you see, like um, you guys really want to bring this new technology or you want to switch to this technology, but that technology is actually pretty old or that technology doesn't work with this agency that I know you really want to work with. All of these things help them to see you understand the agency, you understand where they wanna go and you know how to get them there. Any kind of communication, whether it's between you and your people or you and the stakeholders or your stakeholders in your organization, if you have like a CEO or whatever, you know, honestly, just an org chart clarifies that immediately. Um, transition is a big deal. If you are either this is new work or there's an incumbent, you wanna talk about how can I start this on day one without making anyone panic or lose um, time? Um, who, who's the leadership? Who's gonna be running this thing? Who's gonna be like the point person? Um, what are your measurable outcomes to show like we are actually making progress? And I really recommend that one just because I find if you can come up with your own kind of KPIs then you can write them so that they're sort of positive for you, meaning that you know that it's something that you can achieve. Um, it also demonstrates a level of experience too and what it is that you're doing. It's um, almost a differentiator, if you will. That's a good point. All right. So then in key personnel, I don't really have too many for key personnel, mainly because they did not provide very much guidance. They basically said, you know, we want to know the education, the skills, and the training, the certifications. I can't, I don't know why I can't say certifications. I'm struggling with that word. Every time I say it, I say it Editing wrong. Much this week. 
you've reached your limit. <laughs> yes. I'm like, why can't I say that word? But anyway, um, since they didn't provide a lot of um, either instructions and no evaluation criteria, which I really don't like that at all. Um, you know, you're kind of free to do what you want here. That's why I said um, you don't have to do a traditional resume here. You can call it whatever you can call it a resume. I mean, you're the boss, right? But you don't have to do a traditional like professional experience. And, you know, you can just have paragraphs and you could even get a little creative and, and talk to the, you know, various PWS items. Um, but this is the only... These are the only kind of blurbs that I could think of for this one. So I don't know if Ashley and Natasha have more. Uh, I, would, I would add to that as like, um, I created like a, a template for, for resumes so that we, so that it's just organized because I find that people just take resumes and they just attach them as a PDF document attachment to the PDF. And then you have like, if let's assume you have like two, three key personnel and two, three different resumes that look absolutely different. It's very, something about consistency is very like, you know, relaxing and you want to make life easy for the contracting officer, right? Like they've been reading proposals all day, right? You don't want them to be like, oh, this person. So you want to make life easier for them, right? So stick to a template, put all that information in a template in your proposal, and then try to highlight the portions of it, like not this person worked at McDonald's 10 years ago. We don't care. Right. We only it, care about what's relevant. <laughs> that's relevant. Exactly. Like you can even highlight, like we have a section where I highlight, I'm like, this is the key personnel. This is going to be their job category. Um, and this is, you know, these are the highlights that have to do coincide with the, you know, the scope of work. Essentially, these are the reasons why you should care. And why they are the right person for the job and why we chose them as a key personal player. So um, sometimes making it easier for the contracting officer to choose you is always the best way. It takes a little more work, but it's definitely worth it. Ashley, did you want to add anything for a... No, I agree with all that. Sometimes yeah. that's more, right? Like, no, I totally... About the Burger King experience. Um, <laughs> I thought that's I so too... important. <laughs> I've had the same issue where it, you know, our team members will send their resumes. Some of them do them in words. Some of them send a mm -hmm. PDF. So kind of transferring that into a consistent format that's easy to read, but that doesn't take up too many pages of your your proposal as yeah, well. Yeah, because if you have a page limit, that that'll kill it right yeah, there. Yeah, which you yeah. do have a page limit. It's quite long, three pages, but you do have a page limit. I a billion percent agree with you that it needs they need to be consistently formatted. And mm -hmm. they, you cannot have a bunch of random attachments. Yeah. That is absolutely not going to fly. Not only that, they told you to put it in here and then it was limited to three pages. So even if you were to attach it, it's you're not in compliance. Yep. But um, I guess what I'm thinking about for here, when I say meets and exceeds, which this is not helpful here, but there are so many proposals where they will give you either it's a table and they'll say, you know, this person needs to have this kind of a degree or this kind of a certificate. They need to have three years of, you know, management experience. And if I have that, I will put that on one side of a table. And then on the other side of the table, I'll say, <clears throat> you know, this person has that certificate that you asked for, plus they have these other eight certificates. This person has the three years that you asked for, plus they have another five years on top of that. So it shows that you exceed the expectations. Um, I also like to talk about if someone is already badged at, you know, whatever, whatever this work is, if they already have whatever government badge, because that takes time to get, you know, you can't really start on day one because you have to get your badge and you have to go through the paperwork, yada, yada, yada. If you can say this person is badged and ready to hit, you know, the street day one, that really helps a lot. And then Natasha made yeah. me think of roles and responsibilities, you know, helping to understand what will this person be doing on this contract for you. I think that that really helps. Yeah, um, and you could utilize that even in your transition plan, because mm -hmm. right there, you just mentioned a key differentiator. Yeah. I'm ready to rock. 
Yep. You don't have to wait for me to hire and badge and get everyone ready. We're on start phase one. We're ready to go. So yeah. that's a major, um, it's a major discriminator for any incumbent is that no matter how much they might be hated, the thought of, I got to rebadge all these people. I got to bring all their clearances over. I got to, you know, get them all spun up on our computer system. And, you know, it's like, is, is the squeeze yeah. worth the juice? Yeah. So if you say, are is, is the evil, you know, worse than the evil you don't. <laughs> yeah. So you right. got to make it super easy for them to, for mm -hmm. them to say, you know what, I'll take that chance. Um, yeah. And transition plans are super, super key. And I think that kind of leads into like, you know, the importance of your staffing plan, your transition plan, your management approach, your communication plan. Don't forget that, you know, like, and people like timelines, don't be afraid to put schedules in there and give them an idea. The more prepared you are, um, the more confident they feel in your, you know, ability to, to take on the work. So, yeah, I'm going to add, um, cause I think I have transition up here, but I'm going to add staffing and I'm going to add timelines that, that one for sure. Mm -hmm. You have to have, if they ask you about transition, you have to provide them with some kind of a timeline Yep. <clears throat> because they need to know, like a lot of times they'll say to you, you have 30 days to ramp up. Tell me how you're going to ramp up in 30 days and you have to talk through it and we can get into that. I mean, there are some yeah, it has to be real though. It has to be yeah. like a, a it has to be a realistic uh, approach. It's for sure, things. but I, I'm saying I'm saying like things. there are things you can say, like for example, you want to say that you're gonna shadow people that are there now, and then you want to cross. There's some there's some term for it, but it's like backwards shadowing. Cross -trained. What's that? Cross trained? Could be cross training, but it's where like now you're doing the work and, and they're shadowing you to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And, you know, uh, something that we do is we'll talk about um, having like an executive committee for the transition. And mm -hmm. that's where like the presidents of the companies will say that they will be at every daily tag up. That way, if there's any problems, like this person's not getting this thing that they need and this person's not getting this thing that they need, the president will say, I'll have that fixed by, you know, the end of the day, it shows that you have like that buy-in from your, um, from the top. It doesn't have to be the president. I mean, as long as it's at least the COO or, you know, a vice president of operations or whatever, it shows that your company has buy-in that you are willing to do what it takes to get this project off the ground, you know, immediately and correctly. Absolutely. Um, so then my last thing is just about past performance. And um, so they didn't ask, they didn't say anything. They just said recent. They didn't define what recent means. They just said recent, right? So normally they'll say something like three years, five years. So you can use any past performance that you have and you can say, well, it's that's how I define recent. I just, I define recent 20 years ago, you know, they right. didn't define it. Don't ask a question about it. Don't let them define <laughs> it. Right. When DOD will be like, we want at least three years past performance with at least two different federal agencies matching the scope of work within the last five years. With the TCB, you guys <laughs> don't know. ask for it. Don't Both ask for it. Relevance and size and yeah, <laughs> right. Contract yeah. value period of performance. <laughs> Oasis positive uh, CPARS reviews. Yeah, you yeah. don't need you don't need to create a problem where there right. isn't one. Right. Right. Don't ask a question about that. But I remember Oasis had both a, a total contract value requirement and they had an average annual value contract requirement of every single past performance. It, you should have seen That's this a discriminator sheet. that somebody got in there and influenced that in the acquisition. That just sounds ridiculous. To me. It was ridiculous. I mean, the math I had to do to like figure out which projects fell into, you know, before like that was the first thing we had to do was figure out what projects do we even have that hit those requirements. And then we can start figuring out which of those like hit the different. I, I wanted to know how badly you wanted this contract. Apparently, and we wanted it bad. We went after it like 80,000 different ways. 
Oh. Anyway. So all I wanted to say about past performance and then I can be done and maybe we can have questions. But all I wanted to say about past performance is that much like your technical where you're writing to the PWS items, you really want to write to the PWS items as much as you can in past performance. Again, you can't hit every single one. Don't sweat it. You hit every single one across the three projects. Yep. You know, you can have an introduction saying, you know, our three past performances show that we, you know, in an elegant way, hit all PWS items. Yeah. Um, if you're not hitting a lot of them, that might be a heads up. Hey, I need to go get a partner who can hit the rest of these PWS items. That's usually, I don't know if you all have ever gotten into, um, um, what do they call those Com capability matrices where you take the PWS oh. items and you the score yourself. Matrix. Yeah. I you, today, yeah. in fact. Yeah. 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 Um, compliance matrix. I think I have a generic one that we use, but essentially a, a compliance matrix will help you kind of like put in all the requirements and you can give yourself a score mm -hmm. and it will give you what we call a gap analysis. Is okay. there a gap in the amount of work that I can perform versus can? And if I can't perform certain things where I'm not strong or I don't have past performance in certain things, where can I leverage and get that, you know, performance? Because you can submit it as is, but there's a good chance that if somebody has 90% of the, you know, PWS items that they have past performance and they're probably going to win it before you do. Um, so then that's when you decide to team depending on what that looks like. Totally. And also it really helps to do that before the RFP yeah. drops. And you may be thinking, well, how am I supposed to do that if I don't have the RFP? Um, if it's a recompete, use the old draft or the old RFP. Sometimes for really big um, contracts, they'll put out a draft and and it'll be, at least the work will be similar. Maybe the way they have the L and N will change, but the section C, which speaks to PWS or SOW items, that'll be the same. So use that to build yourself a capability matrix and score yourself and figure out like, okay, these are my holes and then someone like Ashley would be able to help you figure out like, where can I find other companies to fill those, fill my hole, got to fill my hole. <laughs> Should make sure people are paying attention. I'm never ending. So another thing I like to do is if there's some specific instructions, like they said here, when you submit, include this in the subject line of your email, I like to put a comment in here so that as I'm cleaning out my comments and that sort of thing, like at the very end when I'm getting ready to submit or to clean out my instructions and that sort of thing, I actually will set up the email that I'm going to submit just in my drafts. I won't put the person's email in the two line. I'll put it in the body of the email so that I don't have to worry about it accidentally getting sent. But I'll set up the whole email in terms of putting the, the number that they asked and the company name, and I'll turn on the read receipt and the delivery receipt. Um, but anyway, I, I just like to Why make bad. myself the, these notes. I do that a lot. I do. Because I did not. I, I, re I use it to remind myself, did I do something? Yeah. Because I'm probably going to want to know that later. And by the I time I'm done writing all these pages, there's no I'm way exhausted. I'm going to remember if I did that thing. So that's just the beginning. The <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's 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 enough to get you all started, right? Yeah. Um, There's a then, lot of process. And then you start writing. Yeah, you start writing. That's when you really start putting the meat and potatoes, all the guts. Yeah. And fill in all the holes. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot believe none of you had questions today. I hope you enjoyed the second half. Um, to see sort of what it looks like now that we're getting closer to it being an actual proposal. Um, I want to thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming That's back awesome. for preparing this for us. I know it was time, essentially, and I, I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with our audience. <laughs> Natasha, as always. Freaking <laughs> <laughs> love it. This was really, really good. Thank you for having this was really me. helpful. Yeah, I, I see so many people ask questions about like, how do I just, like, how do I get it started? And I'm like, I get it, I get it. 
Well, because like, you know, we've seen it a million times, so we're used to it. Yeah. But if I was just coming into the scene and was like, you have to write a proposal. Well, how does that work? Like, what does that look like? What is the format? Like, what do I do? Where's I was here? Was a template? Yeah. Um, and I don't think people really care like of a template that's specific to this, you know, particular opportunity. But just give me some sort of a segue here because, you know, right. just to create it off of just GP uh, making it up for yeah. someone who's never done it, it's that's overwhelming. Totally. And and I. I don't really even know like how do people learn this other than just other people teaching them yeah, but sure. i really think that as long as people understand that you use the instructions in section l to to set it up and you should you know you're already like 60 percent of the way there maybe even more than that because then you're just putting in things like evaluation criteria and PW, which I shouldn't say just i mean that is incredibly important it's super important right but i taught it, myself via it, book it, it, and getting what? like you can get a book what is that is that Shipley? Oh, proposal Shipley. writer playbook shipley's proposal writer playbook i, I have that one i have the proposal management capture management bd i read all of them but i read every single proposal book that anyone ever writes which aren't very many if you <laughs> but you know you or you can one, say, there's plenty of courses to mm -hmm. where people teach them you know what i mean so i always tell people you could do udemy udemy has them i think for like 20 to 100 books mm -hmm. max. um so it's 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 worth taking a course um a quick easy course and just getting at least the the, the basics down packed and over time as you're learning you're gonna get feedback and you're gonna ask for that debrief you know what Winner did i lose mm -hmm. yes ask for that debrief because you're ask gonna refine your skills yes. you're gonna know either what you did right or what you did wrong you um, missed this. You missed that. Cool. Yeah. Notate it. Lessons learned. Just understand that every time you lose something, it's something you actually gain. You didn't lose. You didn't win now, but you will win later. And you will take that knowledge and you will grow and you'll be like, OK, well, next time I'll remember to, you know, pay attention to this or I missed that. I missed this and keep those yep. notes and you get better over time. Like my first proposal doesn't look like my hundredth proposal. I'll tell you right now. The first one looked like a joke. I was trying to do that on Canva. I didn't know you had to do word formatting. Um, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> the whole thing to this. I was like, oh, back to school I go. So like I had to learn, you know, and now I can write, you know, multi-million dollar proposals. <laughs> but before I, I struggled with a $10,000 one. So you will learn. It better. And, yeah, yeah, it takes time, guys. It really it does. does. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Bye, in case everyone. we get cut off <laughs> bye everyone have a great weekend